Um, I, uh, I'll start with a very, very brief story, which actually I have no brief stories, only long stories. But the, uh, I started working with the umbilical cord almost uh, when I got here uh, in uh, the uh, mid-90s. And so I had a big project running at St. Joe's and we were looking at cord bud. And the deal was that we would <laughs> wait around like vultures outside of the maternity ward for the, for the uh, placenta and cord to come out. And then we would take blood out. And one of the things that struck me when I was there is that surely there's got to be a better use for this blood than me and my study because we could often get 30, 40, 50 mils of blood out of, blood out of one placenta and cord. Uh, and but I never really pursued it, but it was interesting to me. And at the time, they were actually collecting all the uh, placentas and putting them in a big fridge and selling them for, uh, for uh, cosmetic products at the time. But in the end, the company quit coming, and so we just had a big freezer full of frozen placentas, which is not the easiest thing to get rid of. At any rate, um, so this is uh, going to be about contemplating the cord, and here's a rather vernixy covered baby, and uh, you can see the cord uh, looking quite tumescent and, and quite healthy, actually. And you zoom in on the old cord, and you, first of all, you notice that the, the structure is really quite beautiful uh, when you look at it. It has that lovely helical aspect to it, and that's really to keep it from being compressed for the most part. Of course, we do take blood out of it. We can take blood out for harvesting stem cells, but we also uh, look at uh, the gases in the cord. And then uh, the other thing, of course, are those stem cells. And, and here's a nice uh, close-up. I noticed online you can just go now and buy umbilical uh, stem cells uh, if you want them. And so we're going to talk about all aspects of that. So the outline uh, is just the intro to a little bit of the development of the cord because it's actually not well understood. Uh, and then they, we're going to do a little bit on the cord and uh, uh, how the newborn transitions, which is filling me with dread now that Dr. Marin is here. So. <laughs> I'll just let him do that part and I'll sit down. And, uh, and then we're going to talk about clamping and that's uh, Dr. Hutton's part of this. And then we'll do some questions and then a brief sing-along at the end. Um, okay, so the role of the cord. So as, as many of you know, it's, it's really the point of it is just to connect the placenta to the baby, right? It's not really very complex. And in fact, it's kind of a gill, right? If you can imagine a fish's gill and it's dipped into the water. Well, the only difference, of course, is that in the baby, it's dipped into maternal blood. And so they're going to take off uh, everything they need. So we're going to get deoxygenated blood going out to that gill, the placenta. And uh, it's going to get reoxygenated. You're going to send waste out. And then it's going to get cleaned up. And uh, it's going to come back along the umbilical vein with a little bit more oxygen and less uh, waste material. And with any luck, uh, that's going to keep going. So if we look at the placenta itself, we've got this nice maternal artery at the top. And it's bringing in that nice fresh blood. And then we have the spiral arterial going through uh, the, the uh, endometrium there. And then we have that intervillous space. And so that's the, that's the water that the gill is sort of swimming in, right? And uh, then we have a, a, a venial, and that's going to be draining the blood out from that intervillous space. And then out it goes back into circulation. So on the baby side, <coughs> we've got our <laughs> umbilical arteries. Now, Remember, of course, that they're deoxygenated, even though they're uh, umbilical arteries, sort of like the pulmonary arteries. And then we've got a umbilical vein, and now it's gained its oxygen from the mum. And if we look at these villi right here in a scanning electron microscope, we see these chorionic villi, as they're called. See how they're hanging down? So they're hanging down like little fingers into maternal blood, uh, doing a really good job of removing uh, oxygen. The point of it is that this material that we have right here, the cord, is kind of a seamless part of the placenta. And at any one time, the blood is going to come through and then back out through the veins in this fashion here. So you can see the blood coming in and spiraling in, and then it's going to spiral back out. At any one time, there's probably 150 mils or so of blood in the intervillous space. And uh, mom is maybe giving 20 or 25 percent of her whole blood flow uh, to that area. So it's a a lot of blood going on there to feed the placenta. Well, the natural life of the cord is uh, the most interesting part here for me. So we're just mammals, right? There's really nothing too special about, uh, about our umbilical cord and placenta. Ours is slightly different than some animals, but what happens, say, in horses, right? I mean, if we imagine humans for a long time probably didn't have someone chasing them around, helping them to deliver. Um, what happens in a horse? Well, if we look at what happens in a horse, the foal is normally going to be born with the uh, with the mare lying down, and then the foal's going to be pushed out, <coughs> and, the, and the mare, as you can imagine, will sit there for a little while and sort of think about things. And then either the foal or the mare is going to get up, and the umbilical cord is broken. 
right? That's how it works, right? Makes perfect sense. So um, there was a, something that came up in the, in the early 60s, a few papers about it, this new thing called convulsive syndrome. And uh, they looked at the newborn uh, thoroughbred foals, right? So the new, very expensive uh, horses. And uh, they found that this convulsive syndrome was only happening in foals that were born indoors under human supervision. And the question, well, what's happening here? What, why would a horse be born and looks perfectly normal? The veterinarian comes in and they're watching and when the baby's born, they clamp the cord and then a little while later, the, they have a dead foal on their hands. So what happened there? Well, when they did the autopsy of the foal, they'd find that the, the lungs were so dense that they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even float in the formalin that they were putting them in to have a look at them. And, and why was that? Well, the reason for it was when they had veterinarians indoors watching the foal, as soon as the, as soon as the foal would come out, they'd immediately clamp the cord. And without adequate blood going from the placenta and the cord back into the foal, the foals often did very badly indeed. And so if it's true for uh, horses and zebras, you can see here's a, here's a little zebra waiting to stand up and, and break his own cord. Um, and similarly true for things like, uh, like sheep. Here's a, this is very clever. The sheep is, uh, is actually going to um, push the little uh, uh, lamb along and then eat the placenta and cord, which is <laughs> with nutrition, I suppose. And uh, so that'll work out. And uh, so that's going to break that cord that's been broken. And even when you look at seals, uh, they're going to be born. There's some placenta and a cord. And uh, they also have, they have uh, galls there to clean things up. So I suppose in our maternity wards, we have more seagulls. They can just come in and clean everything up. But the point is, of course, that you don't, uh, the natural thing is to just sort of let things happen. And uh, the cord itself is, <coughs> is kind of interesting. Sometimes it's very uh, peculiar. Um, the cord itself sometimes has knots and twists and wraps in it. If you look at it, uh, occasionally you'll see knots. You don't really worry when you have perhaps one uh, light knot, but when you have three of them, you might be into problems. Uh, sometimes you get really crazy knots occurring on very long cords. So typically the cord is 30 centimeters and, and certainly less than a meter, but when they get really long, the more likely they're going to loop. And then finally, you do sometimes get nuchal cords, so they're going to go around the neck of the baby. Maybe 20% of babies have a nuchal cord. We don't really worry about it until you get a couple, <laughs> and then they, they're going to cause some problems for that fetus. Um, <clears throat> when we look at that umbilical cord, we see they come in two varieties. We have the sad kind, and we have the very happy kind. <laughs> <laughs> But when we take it in cross-section, uh, it looks considerably different. So this is the same as before without the nuisance nonsense that I put in. And you can see that we're going to have our uh, umbilical arteries normally paired occasionally. You know, you're going to get one that only has one artery, which is not good. And then we're going to have our umbilical vein right here. And the umbilical vein, it's easy to tell. It's way larger. <laughs> and it's usually compressed because the walls are not quite so thick. And uh, what we have here is the magical part. Uh, this is Wharton's jelly. If there ever was an unlovely name, I would say that uh, Wharton's jelly is it. And uh, the Wharton's jelly, when you look at it really closely, you'll see these funny little stellate cells. And uh, if you look at them, they're scattered all over the cord. And uh, these are what we refer to as, uh, well, mesenchymal uh, stem cells, fibroblasts, and myofibroblasts. And so the latest research is actually showing that on the outside, more towards the outside of the cord, we have these stem cells. And then as uh, they grow up, they become fibroblasts. And a little bit later, they become myofibroblasts. So they're actually contractile to some degree. And so the important thing about that is that there's this development. But the cord grows really rapidly, right? So it's got to have a lot of stem cells to accommodate all this additional growth. So you've got lots of stem cells there uh, at any one time. And so when we look for uh, cord-derived mesenchymal stem cells, we're really talking about these little fellas here. And when we look at blood-derived stem cells, what they're doing there is simply taking the blood that is in the cord and the placenta and then extracting out blood. And so, of course, in the blood of babies, there is some stem cell, but not nearly as dense as you would expect to see in this Wharton's jelly. And remember that Wharton's jelly is, uh, remember if you saw it from before, it's actually continuous with the placenta. So there's quite a lot of this around. And uh, so that's what we're looking at when we're talking about these different things. Um, just to uh, give you a little uh, anatomy lesson, since I want to do that, 
Um, if we look at the, what originally happens is we have a trophoblast. So this is an invading egg and we've got the trophoblast forming and that's going to become the placenta, right? It's going to invade into the endometrium of the uterus. And where is it heading for? Well, it's heading for uh, the, and the uh, maternal blood vessels because it has to get oxygen, right? So it's heading that direction. And uh, what's going to happen here, there's our amniotic cavity. Hard to believe, but this is the embryo and this is going to grow to completely surround the, uh, surround the, the uh, fetus as it grows. And then about uh, 14 days after ovulation, it's already embedded and we can get this thickening down here. And uh, we got the little amniotic sac getting bigger. Of course, we've also got the yolk sac, which is going to be a lot more significant if you're a chicken, uh, but not so much for us. And then the other thing that's happening is we're, getting, we're beginning to squeeze out cells from between these two layers uh, of, the, uh, of the developing embryo. And this is that extra embryonic mesoderm. So from a uh, developmental point of view, that extra embryonic mesoderm is going to become that Wharton's jelly that's going to have all the stem cells in it. And it's uh, very rapid growth occurs because it's got to fill up the core of the placenta. So this whole area here is going to become the placenta uh, ultimately. So old Wharton, this is Wharton himself. I guess all the, <laughs> the good organs were gone by the time he got there. And uh, so he identified this mucous connective tissue uh, in the cord. And what did he find? Well, <clears throat> it's pretty much the, one of the few places in the body where you're going to find mucous connective tissue. Uh, you can find it apparently in, the, in, the, uh, in some teeth, uh, at the base of teeth, which is relatively hard to get at. And what you'll find is that it has all this ground substance, it's mostly hyaluronic acid, and a few collagen fibers and then some fibroblasts. And so everybody ignored it, right? I mean, just partly because of the name. Uh, but the, the, uh, you know, the, the pool of money for Wharton's jelly research was probably pretty thin. And uh, nobody really looked at it until uh, about uh, 1991. And then what happened was they started to identify a lot more of these fibroblasts in there. And someone said, well, they look like fibroblasts that looks, have a lot closer look at them. And it turned out there was a tremendous number of mesenchymal stem cells right there. And of course, now they can get them to become any number of different types of cells at any time. And so since this uh, 1991 article, there's you know, entire companies based on doing nothing but, but uh, finding these cells. So Wharton became famous. Now if we look at the newborn transition, and this is the part that fills me with dread, um, is uh, looking at the, uh, really the importance of that blood to the uh, development of the, uh, the newborn. So transitioning from being a fetus, which is a type of fish, kind of, <laughs> swimming in maternal blood, breathing through its gill, to an air-breathing organism. Well, if we look before labor, about 30% of that, um, the blood is going to be in the, uh, of the baby, is going to be in the placenta and the cord. So something around that range. And now, <clears throat> when the uterus begins to contract, and, and again, I'm not talking about, you know, cesarean deliveries. This is old, old school. <laughs> and so the uterus is pushing down. So it's squishing on the baby, but of course, it's also squishing on the placenta and the cord, right? So it's increasing the pressure. And it's increasing that pressure to about 80 millimeters, we think. And so that's pushing a lot of that blood that was in the stem and the cord uh, back up into the baby. So what's the upshot of that? Well, that's going to bring up neonatal uh, blood pressure. So it's going to push it in. And what's going to, what it's going to do is a small amount of blood that's going to the fetal lungs at this point. It's not a tremendous amount. Remember, there's shunts in the way. It's going to start to erect those capillaries that are surrounding the lungs. And so the uh, idea is that we're going to have pulmonary artery blood being pushed now because the blood pressure is going up, right? It's going to be pushed around the outside of the alveoli. You can see the individual alveoli here, and this is a whole lobule. You can see that it makes a bit of a, a superstructure, right, around the outside of this. And what happens is if we push blood through, we sort of start like this. So imagine that the alveoli, of course, is compressed and collapsed, right, when the baby's, uh, when the fetus is uh, inside. And of course, what happens is the blood vessels are right here and they're completely collapsed. But what if we start increasing the pressure? So if we start pushing down, what happens is that we begin to blow up all those blood vessels. And that's one of the features that's going to try to open up the alveoli. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm just, just checking that he's not sending daggers my way. So there you go. 
<laughs> I know. I wasted an obscene amount of time finding this slide on the internet, so just so you know. So I, I kind of like this slide because it does show you this, the network of capillaries around the outside of the alveoli. So you can imagine it pulling outwards. Is this the only important thing? Of course not, <laughs> right? Newborn transition is more complex. Other things that are going on is, first of all, there is fluid in the, in the newborn lung, so it's got to be moved out. Now, mostly it's going to be moved out because it's following sodium. So sodium's pumped out of the, uh, of the essentially, the, the fluid inside of the lungs, and the water follows it. So that's going to dry the lungs out a bit. And of course, if you squish down on the baby, you're going to begin to push out any fluid that's in the trachea and in the bronchioles. And when it goes out, it's not going to really want to come back in because babies have an epiglottis too. And so it's going to close down. And so that's the other features that are really important for this transition to breathing air. Um, and so as we go, the air is going to begin to enter those lungs, those uh, pulmonary blood vessels, because uh, we've got air in there, that's going to dilate the blood vessels in the, in the lungs themselves. And we're going to slowly now decrease the amount of resistance going through the circuit, right? So now on the pulmonary side, the blood vessels are beginning to dilate, and now blood can begin to flow through the lungs. Now the pressure on the right side of the heart is actually going to go down, right? Because the blood that's supposed to be going to the lungs now can, and the pressure goes down on the right side. The pressure on the left side of the heart is actually going to go up because now it's going to be pushed blood all over the body, and that's going to close the foramen ovale. I probably should have had a slide for this. <laughs> Rather than modern dance, it's probably not helping you very much. And what's essentially going to happen then is that we are going to increase pressure on the left, decre or decrease pressure on the right. But the question you're probably asking yourself, what about those little pulmonary, or those little uh, umbilical arteries? How come they're not just pushing blood back into the placenta, right? Well, it turns out that the umbilical arteries are, are going to uh, constrict. So as soon as you get enough oxygen in circulation, we're going to constrict the umbilical arteries that are going up uh, through the umbilicus into the, into the placenta. And then uh, that process is going to crush those down, and then the vein is going to collapse, right? And so what we needed, though, fundamentally here to get this whole process started, one of the most important things we needed was the blood. <laughs> right? We needed all that blood that we had, the blood that was in the placenta and that was in the cord in order to help this process go along. And so I'm going to give that up to Dr. Hudson and we're transitioning now. So presumably I'm the fetal form and you can be the uh, air breathing form. Thank you.